every time I got money from this business, it went into real estate. And that was kind of like how I kind of structured everything as the goal from like getting out of college on was anything you make goes into real estate. And then we just like save it here. Then it goes into real estate, which was great. Hey everyone, I'm Annie Dickerson and on behalf of the entire Good Egg Investments team, I wanted to welcome you to this episode of The Life and Money Show, the show where we talk about everything from investing to financial freedom to parenting, traveling, creating a life by design and everything in between. I'm here, of course, with my amazing co-host, Susan Elliott. Susan, how are you today? I always like straighten up just a little bit when you say that, like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I am here. I'm doing really good this morning. It's um, Tuesdays are like a fun, busy day, but we get to talk to people and have great idea sessions. It's like got a great, great Tuesday energy over here. Indeed. We just wrapped a great conversation with our guest, Charles Carrillo, which we're going to dive into in a little bit here. But tell everybody a little bit about what we're going to be talking about on the show today. Charles was a great guest. He does very similar things to us here at Good Egg. And what's really wonderful is that his backstory gave this wonderful window into the life of like how we all find real estate investing. And there's so much we can all resonate from that. And what I really loved is like, his insights and experience as far as like what we're exposed to as kids and how that can make a huge difference where we end up as adults. I think about that every day as I wrangle my kids around the house, as we choose activities and things for them to get into and thinking about like helping them get started along the way. A big motivator for my investing is that I'm setting them up to be able to have these decisions and create their wealth for themselves. I want to give them some wealth to be the seed. More so, I want to teach them how to build wealth, not just hand it to them. And Charles has some great stories about how he experienced that as a kid and how that led to where he's at. And then the second big part of where we got in today is the whole aspect of foreign investors and helping them get into the U.S. real estate market. Something we take for granted, I think, living here in the U.S., that it's an incredibly more or less stable assets class that we're able to get into and leverage in our wealth building process. And we talk a little bit about his travel experiences and how he's integrated that into his professional life as an entrepreneur and building businesses. I really liked his one tip at the end for how to set yourself up for success to be able to travel at any point you want. He has one criteria that really, really hit home for me. Yeah, we covered so much in this episode. And the thing about the foreign investments is we looked into this years ago when we first launched Good Egg, and it was not that easy. If I remember correctly, you had to travel to the US to set up a bank account. That was like a big hurdle to getting started. But the process that Charles talks about now, because a lot of things have changed over the last several years, and so it's become much easier. So anybody can do it from anywhere. So if you're listening to this and you're not based in the U.S., but you've been curious about investing in U.S. real estate, listen through because Charles will talk about the process that you can go through to actually invest in U.S. real estate. But before we dive in, and we're going to cover a lot here, if you are, whether you're a foreign investor or you're based in the U.S. and you're interested in investing alongside us, in US-based real estate, mostly multifamily and some hotels as well to diversify your portfolio, perhaps out of the stock market, or maybe you have some rental properties and you want to take your foot off the pedal a little bit and be more of a passive investor. Uh, We would love to have you within the Good Egg community. A great place to get started is to join our Good Egg Investor Club. It's a community of investors just like you who are looking to build wealth for their families. So to get started, you can go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And within that page, if you are a foreign investor, there's a survey that you can fill out to get in touch with us and let us know so that we can reach out and support you in that process. All right. With that, Susan, you talked about some of the seminal experiences as kids that we've gone through that have shaped the way that we look at wealth and money and real estate. Charles talks about it in our conversation with him, but I'm curious, does anything come up for you as you think about your childhood and your outlook now? Well, I mean, I think sadly, everything I look back on has been a deterrent 
to get into mm-hmm. money and to understand finances from a kid. I'm sure that somewhere in there, and maybe I need to do a little bit of meditating on it. There's experiences that did make me want to turn towards money and investing. But I think the power of like bringing your kids into the conversation here is something that he really talked about. And it was never part, it was in fact, like the, as the opposite, like that's, you don't have to worry about that. You don't ask about that. I mean, it, no, no one ever told me not to ask about it, but you just didn't ask about like how my engineering stepfather brought home money. He just had an engineering job. I had no idea how much I knew my mom was a teacher. It was probably less. And then my father was, I had no idea how he was even making money. And so I just didn't know. And I think that caused me to ignore money through my 20s in a really, really negative way. And so hearing Charles story about how he grew up around real estate investing around the like really tough properties where gritty properties, uh, yeah, gritty (laughs) properties. He told some stories about his class D um, showings, but every two weeks he, he dropped that. And I was like, wow, every two weeks you went. So like continual little micro exposures over time. I think we can't expect our kids to like fall in love with investing the first time we talk about it. But every time you talk about money, every time you bring them into the conversation, how that manifests and how he saw the parents of other kids like, wow, they're driving really beautiful cars, but they get home at 7 30 PM every night. And he's like, my dad's been home since two 30. Yeah. <laughs> it's like oh that's a dream goal and that's how we're building our lifestyle too like we want this flexibility and freedom it's a huge priority for us and that's what's led us into real estate investing and working for companies like good egg i mean Mm -hmm. it's a big deal so how about you what you expose your kids to kind of weave itself into your life well you know i was just talking to my mom about this yesterday actually how my experiences with money growing up have shaped my outlook. And I think my kids have a very different experience than I did growing up. So I was born in Beijing and then moved to the States when I was four. Now in Beijing, both sides of my family were considered middle, upper middle class within China. And so I had, let's say a lot of outfits, a lot of shoes, a lot of toys, like a lot of things, right? And then we moved to the States And my dad was getting his PhD at Iowa State. My mom, she couldn't work as a nurse anymore because of her licensing. And so she became a nursing aide, working shift work by the hour. And it very quickly dropped us into a lower income situation. And being four or five years old, I didn't understand that. I just knew that all of a sudden when we went to the store, instead of buying me the thing, my mom would say, next time, next Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And we would start shopping at garage sales and yard sales. And all my stuff that I wore was secondhand, but I didn't care about that. I was a kid. And then later on in life, right out of school, I went to an Ivy League school, but what did I do? I became a teacher in a low income, high poverty, high crime area right out of school. And then over time grew my income. But as an adult, money has never been like, the thing that's gotten me to take this job or try to stay with this company, get this promotion. I've never been like, oh, I just want to stay for this bonus. That's never motivated me. And looking back, I wonder if that fall from grace, so to speak, from the (laughs) higher income to lower income kind of played a part in that where I was like, you know what? Doesn't matter how much you make. At any income level, you're going to find things to be joyful about. You're going to find challenges Mm -hmm. to face and you're going to have people around you. And so maybe on some subliminal level that impacted my little mind. And I was like, money isn't the driver of all things. It's certainly a tool Mm -hmm. and it can shape your life, but it's not the be all and end all. A great like parallel lesson to think about as we talk to our kids about investing and growing businesses and also just pointing to that like money i mean see our last episode here (laughs) on money and happiness like does money are you using it as a way to be happy and yeah that's a great way that you've been able to have that experience and then give kind of use that to build what you want for your kids and their knowledge of investing yeah yeah but what charles talks about with the realization that he had with his father growing up all these Other kids, their parents, as you mentioned, would work late. They'd have all these fancy clothes and cars, but 
the lifestyle he realized wasn't exactly what he wanted for his own life. And here he saw his dad with this kind of a messy real estate portfolio, and he had to go to these weird spots and talk to these weird people. But then ultimately, he was able to create this lifestyle that gave him a lot of freedom and flexibility, road trips, and these longer family travels that they were able to take. And I think that right there is something that I've learned in my adult life. I didn't have that epiphany as a kid. I was just like blinders on going towards the straight Mm -hmm. A's and the Ivy League school and the climbing the corporate ladder for 40 years. That was my vision of a successful life. I never, never took into account the time, the freedom, the flexibility, what I actually wanted out of a life, what a life by design would look like for me. It never occurred to me. You didn't see it. You didn't have that model in your life. Oh, absolutely. Man, just like right there, we all need to live a life by design to be the models. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. such a good point. And I mean, he saw it with his fight. He had that epiphany because he saw the, it's almost like rich dad, poor dad, right? And he was able to see that stark difference between, wait, society's telling me to go this way. But mm-hmm. here I see my dad's got pretty much everything that I want. <laughs> and he's got he's a, having a lot more path. fun. Yeah. And their dads <laughs> have great suits. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, it's something that in the 10 years after college, I had nine different jobs chasing that American dream, trying to climb the corporate ladder. And that flexibility never really played a big part for me, let's say, until probably having kids was definitely a big part of it. But also, I think getting into my 30s, and now I'm at the precipice of getting into my 40s. And now I'm like, I don't want the grind anymore. I don't want to be like just blinders on and forging ahead and nine to five and limited vacation. And I want to be able to turn the whole thing on its head and focus on the life I want to live. Because now at this so-called midpoint in my life, I realize we're on borrowed time here. This is not an endless venture here. The clock's going to run out at some point. And so if I don't take the reins now and figure out what that life I want to live is now, I don't want to be 65 and my body might not be in the same shape that it's now. And I might not be able to be as mobile and go to the places I want. And only at that point to be able to live my life by design, I want to be able to do it now which is why as we've built Good Egg too, we've so intentionally built into the culture and the company, the ability for anybody on the team to have unlimited time off. Um, As long as you're getting your work done and you're contributing to our overall mission and vision and goals, if you want to go and take a two-week vacation, great. We support you. We love that. And so hopefully for all our listeners You might not be in a position where you're, you have unlimited time off, but there's always little ways to find bits of life by design, even within whatever structure you have. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying like, well, I can't do that. My company doesn't allow that. Say, what if I could take off for two weeks here and two weeks there, right? Like Mm -hmm. you just got back from a phenomenal trip and I got back from one about a month ago but yeah. we're also like, I want we'll to trade now. take a week off. So I just got back from Singapore and Bali. Susan, you just got back from Costa Rica. Now I want to switch. You go to Bali and I yes. will go to Costa Rica. <laughs> Amen. I think that was the big epiphany I had. Like I can take a week and a half off, two weeks off almost with travel because traveling with little kids to Costa Rica takes like yeah. four days <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> total to there, two back. <laughs> But I'm also going to like probably take some time off over Christmas, right? I mean, it's not like I've now just spent my total and I can't do that. But so ask what if I could do this instead? Mm -hmm. Like what if I could take this time off and really show up and serve and propel the mission forward at my employer and my job? I think about that in terms of getting my work done so that I can be able to have this flexibility that Good Egg has built into the foundation of it, because now it's on me. And I'm like, Oh, okay, I can make this happen in ways that mean a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's not always easy, right? When you finally have that freedom to be able to do it the way that you want, people think, Oh, that'll be easy then. But it's not always because then you've got to take the initiative 
and you've got to imagine and you've got to think ahead to what you want that to look like and design toward that. So for anybody listening, start that process today. Wherever you are, there's at least something that you can do. And we have great resources on our site, in our blog, in our YouTube channel. And on this podcast, we did a three-part Life by Design series a while back. So check that out. But that Life by Design, it's accessible to anybody. And especially with some of the tips that Charles talks about in our conversation with him. So with that, shall we dive in? Let's do it. Let's Let's do it. Let's dive into our conversation with Charles Perillo. Charles, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're fantastic. We are so excited to have you here. You have quite a story. You've done so much travel. You've built up multiple businesses. And so we definitely want to hear more and dig into your inspirational story. I want to start with kind of how you got started specifically with real estate, because it's not something everybody gets into. How did real estate come to be part of your journey? Yeah. So I grew up in a real estate family. My dad has been a multifamily investor since 1984. And those properties were, they're really tough properties. They were mainly D to be nice, let's say C minus, but I remember he self-managed them and he had he had some of them with a partner and they had up to like upwards of maybe a hundred units before he started selling them in the late nineties. But he had like a small team that he put together to manage them. But we would go there like twice a week to different properties. And I was Ooh, like, this is like, see lots this is of terrible. Things, I'm, sure. <laughs> this, I'm like, this You're is like, like the I worst thing. I never want to do this. <laughs> like, this is like the worst thing I've ever seen. But it's different because you go to your friend's houses. They have more professional parents, let's just say, that have gone to, uh, they're not attorneys, so all this kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, this looks more like straightforward. Like, you know what I mean? Coming in at this time and my dad's at all different times getting calls and stuff like this. And I think it was like in high school, I started like putting two and two together because we had a summer house that was like three and a half hours away. He'd be able to like go up there for like weeks at a time. We went like a road trip when I was like in elementary school across the United States, like different stuff like this that no one else I knew had ever done. So it was like, you start putting them together. My dad never missed like anything. Like I'm an Eagle Scout, so like Boy Scouts, nothing was ever missed. Any, I played the cross in high school and college, nothing was ever missed. And it was like, you didn't see that from other parents, no matter what their profession was. So I saw That's that. It's so interesting and I was like, that you saw yeah. the parents that had these like traditional, easy looking paths. And then this messy path that your dad had, but then you had that epiphany later on of like, ooh, wait a minute. This path actually leads to the kind of freedom and lifestyle that I want, as opposed to maybe those lawyers who were still working 80 hour weeks. Yeah. Driving really fancy cars and nice suits, but they came in like 7.30 at night, stuff like that. And you'd be over at your friend's house and you're like, oh, my dad's been home since like 2.30. It was like a different thing and that you don't really put it together and uh, until you're a little older and you're kind of like seeing stuff. But when you talk about it more and more, then you're like, wow, this is just like, who couldn't be eye-opening? But I remember my dad collecting rent one time and he's like telling me like half of everything that's collected is profit. And so it would be like, I don't know, you know, he's like, this building pays for your braces. I remember him telling me one time, something like that. It's kind of brought back to your level of like a middle schooler. And you're like, oh, okay. Like, I understand this now. Like, I understand how this all works and everything's put together and it's not traditional, but like, now I know why you've done it. So yeah, that was that. And then, I mean, I got out of college um, in 06. My dad really pressured me to buy a property. Now we call it house hacking, but back then it was just like buying a multifamily, small one that you could get FHA financing for. So it was a three family I lived in one of the floors, rented out the other two. I did it again at the end of 08, which was completely different from the end of 06. Let's just say that. Every time you turned on the TV, it was like, I mean, CNBC, I remember the second property you bought was two months after Lehman and it was like two months before Madoff. So it was just like, every time you turned it on, something was going down, someone went bankrupt, investors were losing money, and then um, it didn't get better for many years. And it was just like, did it- Were your did friends project- at that point, I'm curious, because you were still in your early 20s, I assume yeah. at that point, were your friends like, what are you doing, man? Like you're buying <laughs> all this real estate. Have you seen the news? Like the world is falling apart. Or did you have people around you who were like, oh, that's so cool. I want to buy real estate too. I had one of my really good friends. He was working. He got a job at a private equity firm, very traditional type Connecticut college person. And it was like, <laughs> he was asking some of the numbers and he was like, I had never even heard what IRR was before. I never, still didn't understand what it was or he's done. And I was like, man, it's not that difficult. Like I got this, there's rent, there's expenses. Like I had this really simple, it was like on a Word document spreadsheet I showed this guy. 
And he's like, we put it in here for time value of money. I'm like, it's a three family apartment. It's not like, <laughs> as my dad was, I was a back of the napkin type investor. You know what I mean? Like IRR, I don't know anything about that. I know cash on cash. I know like interest rates. And like, that was kind of how I started out. And you got to get a little bit more sophisticated if you want to start taking people's money. But it was something that at that point, it was just pretty straightforward. You know what I mean? I bought them very close to each other, literally like less than a half mile from each other. So I could manage both of them. And you learn a lot when you self-manage property. I mean, it's just, especially they were C-class properties. My dad really pushed me to buy better properties. And they were, they were like C, then I bought a C-plus I think. They're better. They're much better than the ones he had. But as I've like really gone through in my real estate career, it's more like all now into Bs and stuff like this. You realize that the consistency and the tenant base and how it makes it so much stronger for you and then also easier for you and then also stronger investment for your investors as well. So the natural progression, I don't think anybody really starts off with A's. It's really just like they start on their way up and then hopefully they're not starting in D. Hopefully they start in C though. Very cool. Very cool. Well, tell me about how you've been able to travel to 40 countries. This is something I learned about you when I first read your media sheets. And it's just, that's not something that most real estate investors ever <laughs> consider is a possibility. It's as if there is this given fact that if you are a real estate investor, you have to be managing your properties. And I think now we're even coming into that like, oh, you can do out of state investing. You don't have to be in your neighborhood, your backyard. But even then, to be able to be on the phone calls, to be doing everything and to kind of like weave in the way that you've wanted to show up in your life, maybe similar to the way that your father did that. He was able to be home for Eagle Scouts for all of the after school activities. How was that manifested into traveling a bunch? Well, it's even easier now than it was years back. But when I bought my first property, 06, I bought a few other properties. And then 2012, my family had moved to Florida. I moved down to Florida to follow them. And I had to get third-party management. So it was fantastic because it pushed me to do it. I did it. We had enough units, some of them I owned by myself, some I owned with my brother. And so we did it. And I literally three days after I had given over those keys in 2012, I was in Europe. So it was like, I just something that I'd held off so long and it was kind of now forcing you to do it. And you know, it was great. It was like a fantastic change. But like now it's, I mean, with the apps, with your, back then it was like, I'd have an extra cell phone so you could like put in like uh, SIM cards locally and all this nightmare. Now you have like plans where you could be anywhere and I'm getting data, everything's done like that. But it was- um, Where did you move from? Yeah. So you moved from uh, where to Florida? Yeah, I'm originally from Connecticut. I'm originally from a small town. Connecticut. In Connecticut. So that's yeah, where yeah. your properties were. They were in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And you moved down to Florida and then you're off to Europe. And <laughs> meanwhile, property management, boots on the ground, is taking care of your properties. Yeah, my dad helped me find a good property manager. He just called like a rolled back. He had a Rolodex. He still does probably of people that he knew. And I bought one property from someone years back, my first one and called them. And he was like, hey, and the guy gave him a great reference that I used for so many years until I sold the whole portfolio in 2022. But it was something that <laughs> it was just like it worked out well, like any property manager that's really good. They know the area. They've been there for decades. They like, you're in the truck with them driving around as they're showing stuff. And they're like, we manage this one, we manage this one. And it's like a block away from where you are. And you're like, oh, fantastic. Like, you know, tenant base, you know, everything that goes on in this place. You know what I mean? And that was like a big thing. If I'm speaking to people now, I'm like, this is exactly like how you want to have it set up. And I didn't know I wasn't that sophisticated at that point. I was lucky to find that. But working off those recommendations and then also finding people that knew exactly what they're getting themselves into, right? Making sure it's the same class of properties. They were very comfortable with C-class properties and stuff like that. So that's how I did it. And then um, you are saying before, like in Europe and something like that, or traveling abroad, it, once you have the system set up, I give them the names of the contractors I wanted to use so because I would get a discount with them. And they took care of everything. Unless there was like something large and start off at like $500, you give me a call. And then it was like a thousand and it ended up where after like those first few months of getting it all situated, it was like you'd speak to them twice a month, really, unless there was like a, an issue, you know what I mean? So it was pretty straightforward and mainly would just be emails back with his admin person in the office that was just like telling me about rent getting collected and not stuff like that. I'm hearing a little takeaway of just like there is kind of a ramp to most of these things, these like yeah. big goals or ideas that you have that you don't really know how you're going to get there. And even you got your property managers in place like, OK, call me every five hundred dollars. Call me every thousand dollars. You're building that trust. You're building those systems. Here's my contractors that I know of. That's a level of kind of peace of mind for you. You're working towards this to be able to have that trust later on. You're educating and taking little small bits of action 
so that you have the peace of mind to go after your travel goals, to be able to live a lifestyle that's a little bit more suited to you where you're at right now. That's awesome. I'm curious, how did it feel to sell that portfolio of -of out-of-state rentals in 2022? It was great. I mean, it was just, there were older properties and it was an investor that had properties in the area. And it was actually, I found him by a girl I knew that was a past investor of mine that was like, hey, this person buys a lot of portfolios there if you want to like, or buys properties there and stuff like that. So it was interesting how that worked, but it was great. I mean, small properties are just hard to manage, especially when you have older properties that are in constant need of basic stuff that you take for granted in properties that were built in the last 30 or 40 years. You know what I mean? Like different types of plumbing and different types of electrical and all the different stuff that they used back then that we realized later on that wasn't really the best. You know what I mean? So like asbestos and lead. and <laughs> so uh, <laughs> <laughs> Never dealt with that. No. <laughs> no, no. It's really nice to be out of state having other people manage it at that point yeah. when you're <laughs> dealing with all of that. That's wonderful. And you've helped a lot of foreign investors invest in US real estate. Is there any connection to like your international travels to saying like, how can I help these people? Or where did your drive to help foreign investors come from? Yeah. So in college, I started a small payment processing company and it kind of grew into where I had a lot of several large um, European clients. So I'd go to see them. I had a friend that was living there that I did work with a business partner slash friend. And Eastern Europe, there's so many different countries, everything. So we would travel to see different clients. I spent time over there. It was like months at a time. And so that was really funding my initial jump into real estate, all the down payments, everything else that went with it. Every time I got money from this business, it went into real estate. And that was kind of like how I kind of structured everything as the goal from like getting out of college on was like anything you make goes in the real estate and then we just like save it here then it goes in the real estate which was great but it's also very very slow so it was something that a lot when i was working with clients over there people would ask me because they'd ask you what else you're investing into every time you have a business meeting that's not connected with or veers to different businesses that you might be interested in or investments and it was real estate and i was like really like this is how you do it like this is what we do and he's like people are like wow this is great like how do we do this like and i was like i don't know i'm not sure how you do it like you know we're getting all this great financing because we have the social security number we have the us income or us citizen and stuff like that And then when I put together the podcast and launched it in 2019, that's what I really focused on was international people being able to get into involved with US real estate and saying that's a very stable market. Obviously, what's different? Every country is going to have, there's some countries that are really growing now that maybe you'll make a higher return. But it's one thing that you're going to find is the US is very stable. We have great financing, all the different government incentives that go along with it. So it's kind of opened that up to people and it's available to people all around the world if they're interested in getting out of their comfort zone a little bit and learning about how they can work as an investor here in the US. Very cool. Have you helped people like overcome that challenge? What are some steps that they've taken to be able to invest in US real estate? Usually the usual progression of how this works is that First of all, if I have an investor that comes to us, whether they want to be active or passive, I don't really speak to too many active investors that much anymore. That, But with passive investors that come to us, what really happens is that, first of all, I'll just connect them. If you want to be active or passive, if you reach out to me, I can send you a list of different accountants, attorneys we use. Most of them are here in Florida, but they work all over the United States, depending on where you want to invest. So usually that's the first thing I do is I'll give them a list of different accountants and attorneys that they have to reach out to. And then I'll kind of go through the normal progression of how this works is, first of all, they have to get an ITIN number, which is like individual tax ID number here in the United States. They want to work through one of those professionals because it really speeds up the process. But still now working with one of those professionals, it's pretty takes long. It's like seven to 11 weeks as of like the IRS website recently. So it's quite the process. And then after that, it's usually now they're coming in as really that's kind of like having their SS number for us, social security number, where they can now set up their corporation. And the entity structure is a little different because there's some of these things that they have to watch out for. So here in the United States, federally, let's just say every state might be a little different. But currently right now we have like an estate tax that's like $11 million or something, right? So... If for foreign investors, it's like 60000 So it is something that they have to be very careful. $60,000, I mean, you can make that in no time if you're investing into real estate over a few years. You know what I mean? You don't need like the best deal ever. That can just happen. So it's something that you have to be really know about and you have to speak to the professional and really figure out exactly what entity is best. But after that, what happens is that entity is set up. They set up a bank account. There's a number of different banks that work with foreign investors. So people that might not be based here in the United States, but might just have a corporation 
it used to be difficult a few years back, but now there's a number of different, especially online banks. And then after that, now they have their US entity, they have their US bank account, and now they can just use that as kind of like their holding company. So they can passively invest in syndications. They can invest in anything, whatever they want to, right? Using that setup, they want to open up a brokerage account, whatever they like to do, or they can use it as the holding company for buying a property here in the United States. And one of the big things when I speak to syndicators, I'm like, okay, like this makes sense. Like I understand this. There's a couple extra steps is number one is that we never want to accept any money from foreign entities. We want to make sure that the money, the wires are coming from US entities. And that's twofold. Number one is because they've done what banks call KYC, like know your customer. And the second thing is that because we're not able to do that as syndicators, we don't have access to, um, I'll just mention like Bank of America, so like KYC department of checking where money comes from. And the second thing too, is that everybody knows that syndicating, as you're getting closer to that deadline, people like to send in their wires. And I've known a couple of people that have had wires that they sent in, people actually sent them and they got held up because one of the company names that they were sending from foreign was like, how was on some sort of blacklist, right? Of something. And it's like the money gets held. And now what do you do when you're trying to close on a property? So it's like, just accept it from US entities coming in. And after that, it's pretty much straightforward. Everything else runs the same. The syndicators, they have to speak to their accountant. They might have to do some sort of a withholding on those investors. Um, but other than that, it's a pretty straightforward process. There are a bunch of syndicators that don't like doing it. And there's a bunch that do. So it's something that if you do want to, if you're a syndicator, it's a great way of really opening up people to invest with you. And as a foreign investor, just making sure that people are aware of that upfront, that you are a foreign investor and you know, with a US entity or whatever it might be, that allows you to be entered into a lot more deals than you previously might not be able to. So it sounds like no matter where somebody lives, they don't necessarily need to come and live here in the US or even visit to set everything up. They can do everything virtually. Is that correct? That's right. Used to be with the bank accounts, it would be difficult, but everything else can be done. And now that most people are using an agent or an attorney to set up all their stuff, Mm -hmm. like your corporations, just like you and I would, they can do the same thing. Fantastic. I mean, that opens up a lot for a lot of people, I think, just knowing that that pathway is there. I mean, it makes me curious about as a U.S. resident, how can I invest in other places and what's that path? I mean, just to diversify and to grow outside of our comfort zone, right? Okay, well, I know, Charles, we've covered a lot and there's certainly a lot more, but we're going to dive into some pieces of that in our Life and Money Show Spotlight Round coming up next. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Awesome. We're going to ask you three questions we ask all our guests. The first question is around your life and money. So tell us one thing that you're doing to live a meaningful and intentional life by design. I think the main thing I've done and my wife have done to live is that we have one of our main non-negotiables is that anything that we get involved with, we have to be able to do it remotely. So Mm. it can't be something that we have to be physically someplace. Mm. What was one of the harder things that you're like, oh, wow, okay, remote, how to turn this into remote? It's a difficult thing having properties that even if you don't physically manage them, even if they're nearby or whatever that you might drive by or check something out, or like maybe you do a little bit of work or assist the property manager with to literally just like wipe your hands of that. It's a very difficult thing. I still have the issue now with any rentals we have. It's just like, it's a difficult thing. So I think that's the biggest problem, but it allows you this is the only way you do it. I have to be able to run this by like laptop and phone. And that allows you to even, I mean, obviously traveling internationally is fantastic, but just being able to go see one of your family members or something a couple hours away or spend an extra day or two after holiday or something like this, those things really add up. My wife, before she started business, she worked for a company and like this is, they were so strict on it and she'd be driving across Florida and back across Florida to go back to work and see family. Once that was done, I was like, it has to be done like this. And you have to keep on checking yourself because you're like, oh, maybe I'll like do something. And you're like, it just, it's something that won't work because it doesn't fit into where we are. So we have to like stay our lane. Mm, That's such a good one. We haven't heard that one before. Make sure that you can do it remotely. It's a great frame to think of something like a new venture through. Can we do this virtually? How can we do this virtually? Mm -hmm and remotely and do it successfully. And it really, as you were speaking to earlier, the systems, it really helps you to think through those systems up front, I would imagine. So, And I think even like other realms of your life too, like if I want to start volunteering more, 
what are ways I can make an impact to the organizations that I care about, but that I can do from anywhere. So right. I serve on a board of directors for a national organization. I can do that from anywhere. There's one weekend a month I'm a, I needed physically somewhere and they fly me there. So as opposed to like showing up at my local soup kitchen, which right. maybe I'll be able to do when I'm home, but I need to be able to have that. Yes, I can still travel. This isn't a second job or something. So Right. That's great. That's exactly all right. Second question is about other people's life and money. So share with us one life or money hack, a tip, a resource, a book, anything you've found really helpful on your journey that you think might help someone else as well. Well, let's just say for a book, I would say 80-20 principle. That's a fantastic book. It's very simple. It works in all different facets of your life. Let's just say that from if you're in your business and also in your personal about where you spend time from anywhere from the gym to doing sales, like how you figured out that it's not a correct relationship between the amount of time you're spending and what you're getting back out. And when you do that and you put it on your paper, you figure it out on your uh, sheet here and you're looking at it, you're like, wow, that's pretty eye opening. And that'll be for anybody. There's never anybody that I've spoken to before that it was like, oh, yeah, I knew it was like this because you would have changed how you were working years back. Yeah. So, one other thing for like an yeah. app I use all the time is Trello. So, it's something that Mm -hmm. I use it with my wife. We use it for like pretty much everything for personal, like everything for to-do lists or wherever we're doing. It's just like, cause I'll forget if it doesn't go in that thing. And it's like, <laughs> uh, I use it with assistance the whole nine yards. So that was one thing. And I mean, those are two great hacks that I love using and that I've used in my life. Yeah, those are so good. And whether it's Trello, calendar, something yeah. where you have some place, especially with a remote team, you want to make sure there's a centralized repository for everybody to be on the same page, essentially. And then I love that you brought up the 80-20 principle. It gets me every time. I'm <laughs> like, I know it. And I'm like, I wonder about this, or I wonder what the percentage is here. Or I wonder how to better prioritize. And it always, always comes back to the 80-20 principle. Every time it's like a new aha moment for me all over again. <laughs> Yeah. And you're always thinking, why am I wasting time doing this? Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. That's the answer that comes out of everything. Why did I just waste 80% of my time to get 20% output? I should have done it yeah. the other way around every time. But uh, such a good reminder. All right. So last question is around life and money in the world. So share with us one thing you're doing to help make the world a better place, whatever that means for you. So my wife and I, we do what we call monthly giving. And it's something where we do to different charities. We've been doing it over the last couple of years. It's mainly like food pantries, anything like this, maybe local that they have. So wherever we are, we were seeing family and we were staying for three months out in Salt Lake a couple of years ago, Salt Lake City. But we were doing our monthly giving there. And if we're somewhere else, we'll do it there. Or if we'll do it just in our local areas or different areas or towns, uh, cities without Florida, within Florida. So um, it goes right to the helps people right where they need it. You know what I mean? You have other I just. I think with the food pantries and stuff like this and helping people, it's like one of my things. So that's, we've done to a number of other charities, but it's really over the last couple of years, we've really been like just focusing on like food pantries and doing that monthly. Yeah. What I love most about that is the monthly giving, the intentionality behind it and how you sit down. And I imagine you're going through it together. You're talking about your goals and realigning month to month. And that's such a great way to bring the intentionality and the purpose and the feel good aspect too, and to celebrate um, the opportunity to give. So that's such a great tip for our listeners. All right. So Charles, I know that I think people are going to be super intrigued by this conversation with all the travel you've done, these lifestyle businesses you've built, not to mention the opportunities you give to other real estate investors to invest passively with you. So I know that people are going to want to follow up with you and learn more. So tell them what's the best place that they can go. Yes, yeah, so if you go to our website, harborsidepartners.com, and on uh, harborsidepartners.com, a lot of information there. I have a podcast, as we said before, called Global Investors. We have a YouTube channel. On our podcast, I do two episodes a week, one's interview-based, and one of them is just what I call Strategy Saturday, which is a short three to five minute clip on just anything from what are prepayment penalties to how I was dealing with tenants or something like this or evictions. So people understand and learn more about real estate investing. Yeah. If you're interested in passively investing, fill out a form, get on a call with one of the partners and uh, we're looking forward to speaking to you. Fantastic. Charles Carrillo, real estate investor, entrepreneur, and founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners. Charles, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you so much for having me on. 
All right. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to the Life and Money Show, the show all about helping you to create a meaningful and intentional life by design. For show notes or to listen to previous episodes, go to lifeandmoneyshow.com. For more information on how to invest with us to create passive income and build wealth for your family, go to goodegginvestments.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to us if you would subscribe, share this podcast with a friend and leave us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you incredible new conversations all about life and money. Till next time, remember that your financial journey is a lifelong adventure and we are here with you every step of the way. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.